How can you implement an email verification flow from scratch? Hey, my name is Milan, I'm a .NET developer and Microsoft MVP, and in this video we're going to talk about email verification. This touches on some very interesting topics, such as sending emails, generating unique verification tokens, and then processing all of this inside of your use cases. So let's see how we're going to implement email verification. The first thing we are going to need is a high-level plan for email verification. So what does the email verification flow look like? We have our user trying to register with our system, which is represented with an API, and then we have an SMTP server, which we are going to use to send emails. And there are two distinct flows here. The first one is registering with our API, where we store the user in the database, and then we instruct the SMTP server to send a verification email to the user. We're going to immediately return some sort of response back to the user, and then ask them to verify their email address. In the meantime, the SMTP server is going to deliver the verification email, and then this is going to somehow trigger an action on our API where we need to verify the email with a unique token. So this is the high-level flow. Now let's tackle this in two steps, where the first part is going to be registering with our system and sending a verification email. I already have a registered user use case, which takes care of registering on your user, creating a respective password hash, and making sure that we can guarantee uniqueness for the user's email addresses. Now, the missing component here is email verification to make sure that the user is who they say they are. So what options do we have when it comes to sending emails in .NET? There are so many NuGet packages that you can choose from, and one that I find very easy to work with is the Fluent Email NuGet package. So let's go ahead and install Fluent Email SMTP because I'm going to use an SMTP server to send my emails. With this NuGet package installed, we are ready to send an email. And all we need is to inject the I Fluent Email service, or rather interface, into our use case and we can use this to send an email. How this works is you're going to use the Fluent Email service to construct your email before sending it. So I can set who the email is from by using the setFrom method, or I can also configure this as a default value. I can configure who I'm sending the email to by calling the to method, and we want to send this email to the user's email address. Let's specify some subject. We can say email verification for Calc Connect, which is the name of our application. And then I can specify the body of this email, which is going to contain something along the lines of to verify your email address, click here. And we are going to turn click here into a link, but let's not get ahead of ourselves and go one step at a time. And finally, once you have constructed your email, you can call send or send async. Let's use the async overload, and I will have to await this so that we can actually send our email. Fluent email is just one of the available options. It doesn't really matter what you use so long as you can actually send your emails. Why Fluent email is interesting is because of the Fluent API, which you can see here. And it also has NuGet packages that allow you to integrate with third-party tools for sending emails. A few examples are SendGrid and MailKit, and these tools typically expose a REST API that you're going to call to actually send the email. Another interesting feature of Fluent email that we don't have time to explore in this video is generating the content of your email using a Razor template. I made a video a while ago showing how to use Razor templates to generate PDF reports. Well, you can do something similar with Fluent Email and generating your email content. Now, in order for Fluent Email to actually work, we have to configure it as a service. So I'm going to say in my program file, builder services add Fluent Email. And here I can configure some default addresses, such as who is sending this email and what is their name. I'm going to pull both values from my application settings. So I will say builder configuration and let's say email and let's specify a sender email property. And then let's also specify a sender value. I will say email sender. The next thing we need is to also configure a transport for our emails. And this is going to be an SMTP server. And here you need to specify the host port and an optional username and password for connecting to this server. Now I'm also going to specify this from my application settings by specifying the email host value. And then for the port, because this is an integer, I'm going to say builder configuration get value, which is an integer, and the actual value is inside of email port. So this is our dependency injection setup. Now, how do we actually run an SMTP server? Well, there's a very simple solution for your local development environment using a tool called PaperCut. 
PaperCut also has a respective Docker container, which I'm going to add to my Docker Compose setup. The Docker image that you can run is called ChangeMaker Studios PaperCut SMTP, and I will use the latest version. The default ports are 8080 for the PaperCut user interface, and then the port 25 for the SMTP protocol. So this is how I will be able to send my emails locally, but nothing changes when you want to connect to an actual SMTP server, you will just have to specify the correct host, port, and probably a username and password because your SMTP server will be protected. So let's add my application settings. I'm going to add empty settings in the app settings JSON file and the actual values in my development JSON. The sender email is going to be calconnect at noreply.com. The sender is going to be our calconnect application. The host is going to be calconnect papercut which is the name of our service in the Docker network. This is specified here. So that's what I'm going to use for the host. If you're running this in localhost, then you can just specify localhost here and the port is going to be 25. And this is how I can connect to PaperCut to send emails using Fluent Email. So now let's close this down and let's start the application and see if we are able to actually send some emails when we register a user. If I open up the PaperCut UI on port 8080 on localhost, you can see that I don't have any emails. So let me navigate to the Swagger UI for my system and let's try to register a new user. So let's say new123 at test.com. The other values don't matter as much. And if I send this request, you can see that it succeeds and I get back a user instance. Now, if I go into PaperCut, you can see that we get an email. The subject is email verification for CalConnect and the body is what we set in the use case. So to verify your email address, click here. Our next task is going to be to generate a unique token that we can send to the user and then use that to verify their email address. I'm going to add a new class into the users folder and let's call this the email verification token. I'm going to make it public and sealed and my email verification token is going to have an identifier and this is going to be the actual token value. If you don't want to use a GUID, you're welcome to generate any unique and opaque code that you can use for email verification. This is simple enough for my use case, so I'm going to use that approach. I'm going to add a user ID property so that I can connect this verification token to a specific user and then I want to record when this token was created because we don't want them to last forever. For example, we may want a token to be valid for just a day or two. So I'm going to create an expires on UTC property as well. And then let's add a navigation property to our user just to make our queries easier. So we have our email verification token entity. Now I will go into the database context and let's create a database set. So it's going to be email verification token as the database set type. And then I'm going to give the property a respective name. I also need a fluent configuration for this entity. So let's add an email verification token configuration. This will be internal and sealed. It's going to implement I entity type configuration. And I'm going to specify the email verification token type. In the configure method, I'm just going to say that the primary key is the ID property and I want to establish a foreign key connection between the email verification token and a user by saying has one. The user itself could have many verification tokens, so we will probably need another use case for resending a token if an existing one expired or the email never reached a user. So you can consider this a homework assignment. And I'm going to also specify that the foreign key here is the user identifier property. And this is all I need inside of this configuration. Now, the next thing is going to be to generate a respective database migration so that we can create this table inside of our database. And here's what the migration is going to look like. It's going to create an email verification tokens table with an additional index on the user ID column. And this is going to be a foreign key to the users table so that we can connect our users with their respective tokens. Let me close this down because we no longer need it. And let's go back to our use case. We want to generate this token and store it in the database together with the user. So let me grab the current time so I can record the token expiration by saying date time UTC now. And I want to create a new verification token, which is going to be an email verification token. And let's assign the respective properties. So I want the identifier 
to be some random GUID value, and this is going to be my actual token. Then I want the user ID to be the identifier of the user that I just created. The created on property will have UTC now, and the expires on property will have UTC now, and then let's add one date. Now I also want to add this to the respective database set. So let's add the verification token. And when we call save changes, all of this will be persisted in the database. So now we can start constructing the actual verification link that the user can click inside of this email. So this is going to be a string value. Let's call it the verification link. And for now, let's make it an empty string. But this is actually going to point to a respective endpoint on our API that the user is going to call when they click the link. This is going to be a get endpoint and we are going to embed the verification link into our email. So let's create a link inside of our email using the anchor element. I'm going to turn this into an HTML email by specifying true for the is HTML argument. And we need to give a reference where this link is going to point to. We can do that using the href property and let's make this an interpolated string and now I can inject the verification link. Now, this does open you up to some risks. Because I'm using string interpolation here, I definitely want to be careful how I'm generating the link. And I want to avoid hard coding it. So let's see if there is a smart way that we can go about this. And there actually is. I can go ahead and create an endpoint here. From the user endpoints class, I'm going to say map get, and I'm going to create a users verify email endpoint. For now, let's just give it an argument called a token, and I'm going to leave the body of this endpoint temporarily empty. Then I'm going to give it a tag that I already have here, and I will define another constant that's going to be a string, and I will call it verify email, and it's going to have that same value. I'm doing this so that I can assign it as the name of this endpoint. And the reason behind this is so that I can reference this endpoint using this name from the link generator service that we have in ASP.NET Core. This will allow me to create a URI that's going to point to this endpoint with a specific token value. So let me create another service here, or class, which I'm going to call the email verification link factory. And let's make it internal and sealed. And I need to have access to the HTTP context. So I'm going to inject the HTTP context accessor. And the second service that I need is the link generator. This is going to have just one method called create. And let's say that the argument is an email verification token. Now I can create my verification link by saying link generator get URI by name. And I need to specify an HTTP context as the first argument. Then I can use my user endpoints and access the verify email constant. Now I forgot to make this public, so let's go ahead and update this. And then the next argument is going to be our route parameters. So I'm going to specify token, and we can grab this value from the email verification token. And let's go ahead and create this. I'm going to add a null forgiving operator because I'm confident that the HTTP context will not be null. And then let's return a verification link or throw an exception if this is null. And let's say could not create email verification link. We're going to use this service from our use case to actually produce the link. So let's inject it as another argument. And now I can say email verification link factory create, and I can just pass in the verification token instance. We also have to register some services with dependency injection. So let's say builder services add scoped, and I'm going to specify the email verification link factory and I also have to add the HTTP context accessor as a service. And this completes the first half of our email verification flow. As a reminder, this involves storing the user inside of our database and sending a proper verification email. Now, the next part is going to be delivering this email to the user, which we already have using the PaperCut SMTP server. And now we need to implement the actual verification flow when the user clicks the link that's going to be sent inside of the email. So what we are going to need is another use case that we can invoke from this endpoint. So let's go ahead and create this use case in the users folder and let's call it verify email. This is going to be an internal and sealed type. The only service that I need is my database context. And then let's expose an async method that's going to return a boolean and let's call this method handle. The argument 
is going to be a QID value representing my token ID. And then the first thing I want to do is to try to fetch a token from the database. Let's call this just a token. And I'm going to say context email verification tokens. I want to include the user record using the navigation property. And I'm going to say first or default async where the ID is equal to the token ID. Now, if this token is null for any reason, I'm going to return false, which is going to fail this use case. Now, what are some other reasons where the email verification should fail? If the token is not null, but it expired, then we definitely want to fail this use case. And I can check if the expiration time is less than the current UTC time. Now, another thing that I want to check if the user's email was already verified. I can do that by accessing the user navigation property and accessing the email verified property, which doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and create this property. It's a Boolean property. I will need to create a new database migration to apply this. And I'm going to do this in the background. Now let's go back to our verify email use case. If we manage to pass all of these conditions, then I want to update the email verified property on the user to true. I also want to delete this email verification token from the database so that it can't be reused. So I'm going to say context email verification tokens remove and pass in the token value. And then we want to persist this in our database by calling save changes async. And finally, we can return true from this use case. Inside of the endpoint, I want to inject the use case by saying verify email. Let's specify use case. I will turn this into an async request delegate and let's say boolean success and we get this by invoking our use case so use case handle and let's pass it the token value if success is true then let's return an okay result so i'll say results dot okay otherwise let's return results bad request and let's specify a message like verification token expired we could tie this to the specific reason why this failed, but this is general enough to fit our simple implementation. I also need to register my use case as a service. So let's say builder services at scope, verify email, and we are ready to start the application and test the full email verification flow. Let's start by registering a new user. So I'll say new user at calconnect.com. I'm going to leave everything else with the default values and we hit the breakpoint in the register user use case. So first I'm going to create my user record, then I'm going to create an email verification token, and finally save everything inside of the database. And then we're going to create the verification link. If you take a look at the value here, you will see that it's pointing to our localhost instance of our API, and it's properly formatting the route to hit the verify email endpoint. So I'm going to hit continue, and this is going to send the email using Fluent Email and SMTP. We get a response back in Swagger UI and email verified is set to false. Now, if I go into Papercut and refresh, here is our latest email. And you can see that click here is properly formatted as a link. Now, if you take a look at the bottom left of the screen, you can see that this link is pointing to our API. And I'm going to click this link and we immediately hit the breakpoint in the verify email use case. So let's fetch the token from the database. It seems that it's not null. And the token also includes the user through our navigation property. So we're going to get past the first check, set the user's email verified property to true, delete this token so that it can't be used anymore, and we don't want it to take up unnecessary storage space inside of our database, so I'm going to hit continue. And we get a response back. Now, if I try to refresh this, we're going to hit the same breakpoint again, and this time we're going to return false, which is going to cause us to return a bad request response and is going to print verification token expired. Now, a few more changes that we could introduce here is in the login user use case. We want to make sure that the user is not null, but we also want to check that the user's email verify property is true because we only want to allow verified users to log in to our application. Otherwise, they would have to go through a recovery process where they can specify their email address to obtain an email verification token. Another thing that you should consider, and this is a bonus implementation detail, is implementing a background job that's going to periodically clean up the email verification token table. For example, it could run every few days and remove all verification tokens that have expired. I hope this video was valuable and if you found it interesting then I think you should watch this video next. Check out my clean architecture and modular monolith courses to improve your skills and until next time stay awesome.